What is up, everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place where you get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. We've got an amazing guest here today, a best-selling author. In fact, uh, his book was named one of the best business books of last year. We'll get to him in just a second. We're talking all about negotiation and never ever split the difference, Greg, which is why you will never, ever get your way again for as long as our, our business oh, relationship up. exists. Um, I have just received permission to never, ever split the difference with you, and I will never give in to anything ever, ever again. Um, oh, I, as the audience knows, I am the certified Greg Wrangler. It is my job to keep Greg in line. Nope. I am now being equipped through the content of the show. I will be equipped to negotiate with the hostage taker that is Greg McDaniel, the junior grandmaster himself. Oh, in the Greg, how are you? I'm doing well, and I have. Uh, I'm going to find a way to mute you and even turn your camera off if you keep that up, okay, pal? <laughs> oh man, we got a great guest like Matt was saying, Chris Foss. I, I devoured his book like a wild animal out in the out in the you know wild countryside that hadn't eaten in a month. And guys, I'm not kidding you. I say this a lot, but I'm not joking. Get something to write down. Go rewatch this show. Chris is a, a deep, deep, deep well of knowledge, and you are not going to pick up everything he's going to put down on the first listen to. I even have my dad, the Grand Masters, listening to this, Matt. I even talked him into watching one of our shows live. Ooh, so wow. I know that, Chris, you've, you have achieved the unachievable. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I'm happy to hear that. And keep going. Oh, Greg. We're, we are, so we're thrilled, Chris, to have you here. So I just wanted to preface it by by pointing out a couple of things about the book. So it's it's called Never Split the Difference, which is what, what I alluded to. But so Business Insider, best book, uh, you know, one of the best business books of 2016, listed in Forbes as one of the seven best books on negotiation ever written. Are you kidding me? Um, yes. I mean, that's you're you're an extremely extremely rarefied air, uh, and you're a former international hostage negotiator for the FBI. So before we dive into your background and, and all the cool stuff, we just wanted to welcome you and thank you for coming on the show with us. We know this is not maybe the typical audience that you speak with, but oh my God, do people in our audience need to hear what you have to say? <laughs> uh, thank you. This is, this is going to be fun. I'm, gonna, I'm happy to be here. This is going to be a lot of fun. No, yeah. it, it will. We keep it entertaining with your knowledge. They're actually going to learn something for the first time. So again, a second first for our show. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, okay. uh, so give people just a, a quick indication of your background and, uh, and kind of what you're doing now since you've written the book. All right. Uh, former FBI hostage negotiator, ran our international kidnapping negotiation response operation for several years. Um, originally Midwestern guy, small town, blue collar, Midwestern guy. Started teaching business negotiation at Harvard a few years ago in, in, at Harvard Law School. And one thing led to another and uh, wrote the book. Got a consulting company that teaches individuals and companies how to get better and teach at a couple different MBA programs, University of Southern California, MBA program, Georgetown University. And the cool thing about those programs is that, you know, I, I teach part-timers, which means they got jobs. They work during the day, they got real problems. They're smart people. <laughs> they got real problems. <laughs> they got real problems. Oh, my God. 10 problems. That's yeah. right. So how did you make the jump from the mid from Midwest to lead, you know, FBI negotiator international, you know, how how did that take place cuz Matt's from the Midwest and we're trying to get him, you know, he's finally out on the on the East Coast, on the West Coast with us. So he's didn't move in the right direction. But what was that how that how that looked? Cuz a lot of people that get into real estate, Chris, you know, they come from every type of background and they all want to be top of their game, but they miss one major part of anything business, and that's negotiations. Um, and they just don't, they don't do it right or they don't do it at all or they're afraid of the conflict. I mean, how did you get involved with negotiations? What was that, where, where did that bridge take place? Well, I just, you know, I just, I just wanted to do better at communicating with people. And I was lucky enough to stumble across a couple of guys, actually before I was in a bureau, I was a cop. And uh, some detectives got rotated out of the detective unit. And I was this, you know, push you around type of cop, you know, give orders, adrenaline junkie. And these guys just had this really soft approach and got things done really quietly and really quickly, you know, with this. And they got people to comply with them by, you know, really different approaches. And I'm like, first I was, I said, you know, what are you guys doing out here? And they said, yeah, we got rotated out of the detective unit, you know, normal rotations. And I was just so impressed at the ability to get things done faster by taking an uh, indirect approach or softer approach that it, it, it really intrigued me. And one thing led to another, I wanted to be a hostage negotiator. And then I decided, I mean, why should just, why should just terrorists be the beneficiary of, <laughs> <laughs> why not my ex-wife? <laughs> <laughs> 
Very true. I'm glad. So you want to do it with alternative alternative uh, ideas, but I love where it came out. And, you know, I, I want to, you, you talked about a soft approach and I want to really kind of go down that rabbit hole super, super quick. So many times in negotiations, and I am not a master at this. So if I'm wrong, please smack me upside the head. But it appears that when people, the when negotiations start to break down is when the people start getting hot under the, under the collar and they t start taking things personally. Is there a correlation between losing the, ne the negotiation and getting, per getting your personal you know, feelings involved instead of keeping it professional? Yeah, well, that's everybody gets sucked in right then. You start feeling stressed. You start getting worried about the deal falling apart. You know, our our stress reaction is we're taking ourselves hostage. You, if you're feeling anxiety, you're, you're worried. There's, there's a level of fear there. Mm -hmm. And it's also, we try to get, uh, the real problem is we try to get direct. I mean, we think that being communicating directly with people is a good idea. And as a great analogy, I read not that long ago, like a, a lifeguard saving, a, saving a drowning swimmer. You know, he looks down the beach and he sees somebody drowning. Well, the direct route is actually the slowest route because the direct route would be to swim all the way there. But the hmm. indirect route is going to be to run down the beach where you can move faster indirectly and make hmm. more progress. And so it's understanding that the shortest distance in communication between two points is not a, not a straight line. You know, don't go straight for your goal. You'll get there faster by taking little detours, letting the other side speak first. And your total time actually is a lot less. And it's counterintuitive stuff like that. So you say let the other person speak first, you know, help me understand that, you know, unpack that a little bit for me in regards to, let's say we're negotiating you know, a hostage situation because, or we can talk real estate, any, any time someone wants one thing and the other person doesn't, isn't want to give it, how do you, how do you, what, how do you broach that and let the other person start talking first? Well, we don't want to let the other person start talking first because we're afraid of losing control. And the secret to gaining the upper hand in a negotiation is to give the other side the illusion of control. And when you let the other side go first, you're already in a process of gaining the upper hand. Now, hmm. the, the next thing is, if I let you talk, you know, some have said negotiation is the art of letting the other side have your way. I'm just going to keep you talking until I hear what, what I want to hear. And then when I hear you say what I want to hear, I'm going to go, brilliant. <laughs> and you're going to think it's your idea. <laughs> You're a genius, man. My lord. You are a genius. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very, very similar to the process of coaching anyone to get any kind of result where it requires their active involvement. It's, it's that process of drawing out the response that you want in the sense that and then it leading them to the point where they believe it was them that had a brilliant idea when it was you all along that knew where you wanted to get them and you're leading right. them to that conclusion. Because right, I do right. this to Matt all the time. I mean, I, we were having a strategy <laughs> session today, and I just let him keep talking. I'm like, that's a great idea, Matt. That is a fantastic new program, and it worked brilliantly. Oh, I feel good. Well, he, you know, master. He, originally, he originally wanted to be an astronaut. You talked him into doing this show with you, right? <laughs> I did. I did. But we're talking an astronaut. Like, no, never mind. That's, I'm not going to go there. No, Anyways. All right. <laughs> all right, well, there's, there's something that caught my eye, Chris, that I wanted to go over with you real quick, which is the uh, something you said on, on the blog, which is the, the reverse of the Dale Carnegie. And I, and I love this, and I want, wanted to get your perspective on the whole use of, like, the people's first names because this has been uh, really batted around in the people's heads a lot in real estate to kind of go out of the way to use somebody's first name in the hope that that's going to build rapport. But what's, the, what's your view on that? Well, our, our first name is a, is a precious commodity to us, and we know it gets used against us a lot of times, and we're protective of it. And even when we do use it, we're, we become sensitive to being hammered with it over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, but you can't stop me from me giving you my name and you can even hold your name back. And as soon as I become, as soon as you know my name, then I begin to become a person to you. I matter more to you. It's harder for you to say no to me, the more you know about me. It's actually a, a guy I was consulting with on real estate the other day and he said, yeah, we try to, we try to learn everything we can about our clients and we're having trouble getting emails, responses from us. And sometimes they won't answer us back. And I said, Say what you just said again. He says, well, we try to learn everything we can about our clients. And I said, all right, listen, what does the opposite of that mean? The opposite of that is they don't know anything about you. It's mm -hmm. easy for them to ignore your emails. It's easy for them to ignore your offers. You know about them. They don't know about you. And so it's, let's take the reverse of this process. Let's do little things here and there where we become uh, more of a person, more than a name, like somebody with a whole life stories, you know, somebody who 
who has the same kind of desires that, that, that we have. And as soon as you start triggering that, you start making it harder for somebody else to turn you down. In- so interesting. interesting. So you draw out information about them that then you can come back with your own stories about yourself. So you're exchanging a banter. Am I understanding uh, this correctly? A, a little bit of that. I mean, the, fir- the first thing is really just, just getting comfortable with your first name. Like, uh, you know, I, I think uh, Marcus Lemonis on a prof, uh, on a prophet, mm-hmm. you know, um, he, he just always comes in and says, hi, Marcus. You. That's all he says. Because he wants to be known by the, his first name only, like I'm Marcus Lemonis, the billionaire, the, you know, all the stuff that comes after your name makes your name noise. What really matters is do they know you, are, are they on a first name basis with you? Are you on a first name basis with them is what we always try to get to, but are they on a first name basis with you? And as soon as they become on a first name basis with you, now the dynamic starts to change. That's interesting. That's really, really interesting because it goes against the majority of what people are generally told, you know, when it comes to getting to know someone, it's always about asking about the other person, but if they don't know about you, then how in the heck they don't care about you until they get to know exactly. you. Exactly. Exactly. They don't care mm-hmm. about you. You know, they, they, they like that you care about them and they're flattered by that. And you can make some deals doing that, but this is about increasing your batting average. This is about moving ahead of the pack. It's about doing things not just doing the, the things well that other people do well, but do the stuff they don't do at all, which really distinguishes you. So for for our viewers right now, uh, give, give me an example on a real estate transaction. Let's say Matt is the buyer's agent. You're the selling agent. You know, Matt is, you know, is trying to submit an offer and either you need to build rapport with him. How would you build, how would you insert your name without it being awkward? Um, right. So, uh, the, the, the name of the seller or yeah. the name of the, the name of the buyer, the name of the buyer who's trying to convince the seller to sell. To them. Yeah. 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 You know, um, a friend of mine did that here recently in Los Angeles, uh, with the offer, they submitted a letter, but the, the letter talked about what they hope to get out of the house. And it said, you know, we want this huh. to be a home for us the same way it was a home for you. We want to have the same memories in this house that you had in this house. We want to take care of it. We want it to be a place where we raise our children. Sent this letter in of, of hopes for the house, um, humanizing them, and then also sent in, sent with the letter, a picture of them. Now the seller, very hot real estate market in Los Angeles, the seller not only took this offer, but turned down other higher offers from faceless buyers that mm-hmm. they didn't know anything about. The other buyers are just a signature on a contract, or maybe, mm-hmm. They told them about him. Maybe, maybe their agent had told the buyer or, or the seller about him. But you know, words are written in the air. But a, a letter talking about who you are and what you hope for from the house—I mean, that that stays there. It comes to a um, a seller is a permanent thing. That's not intrusive. I mean, they read it however they feel like it. It doesn't it doesn't make them look at it. And then the la- the last piece, which is was brilliant to that, was you know the image of the people, they become people, they see who they are now. It doesn't matter what they look like, but they're now they're human beings that are much harder, they're much harder to reject or ignore. We actually experienced that two years ago, I wanna say, a uh, family was selling their home. It was multiple offer situation, we were representing the seller. And what happened was, is that the, the it, was a, it was the family's house where these kids grew up and everything else, and mom had just passed. And they took an offer about 15000 less than the other offers because of the letter and the family and the photographs that were submitted. It was so powerful. And I, I'm like, guys, don't you want the extra fifteen grand? they are like, no, we want a family. We want that family to buy yeah, our house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, mo- in, in so many deals, money is, is important, but it might not be the primary game. And if, if you can tap into an emotional undercurrent, emotions become more valuable than money because, you know, money comes and goes. I mean, mm-hmm. money goes in your bank account. You forget about it. You don't you don't have memories attached to money. It's nice. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the, the, the little competitive edges edges that make it make a big difference, uh, usually not associated with money. You know, it's really not. You know, it's a, a lot of the times I was, I always do, inter, I do, you know, messing around on Facebook when I first started doing this thing. I did something just like we were talking about. I made an offer out 
anyone who works with me, I'll pay them a thousand dollars. You know, in the Q, uh, Q4 of 2014, crickets. I posted a photo of just my patio with, a, with my new barbecue going, who wants to go do, get the barbecue on? You know, let's get this happening. <sighs> just comments and likes and everything else. I'm like, it's a barbecue, but it's the emotion. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and the, the thoughts that, 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 that come around that and the mm -hmm. different, different associated things. I, I can remember, when, you know, when I was a kid, uh, when I was in my teens, my dad needed to get a car fixed and he couldn't get the mechanic's attention to get the car fixed. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell, tell him if he fixes your car today, you're going to give him a case of beer. And huh. It was like snapping his fingers. Now, at the time, because I'm old, <laughs> the case of beer was about $18. And if he just said, hey, I'll give you 18 bucks if you fix my car, he, you know, he just spit at him. He, he just said, I'm never fixing your car. <laughs> but, you know, give him something that's worth $18, but it represents so much more. Yeah. So those are little things that make a difference. That's very cool. You know, go ahead, Matt. Sorry. All right. Well, I kind of I, I want to lead a little bit, uh, Chris, down a, a little bit different path because, <clears throat> all right, here's what I'm curious about. So when you go into like a hostage situation, it's very similar to um, it's a very hostile situation. They don't, there's no incentive on their side to get to know you. And, and they might even understand what you're trying to do when you're trying to build rapport and when you try to humanize yourself to them. So how do you get over that initial resistance? Because obviously in real estate, people are so burned out by realtors being unethical and ha not having a lot of integrity and they're just turned off to the business and stuff. So there, there's, a, you know, you'll encounter those situations where there's natural resistance to what you want to do and people are already have their shields up. How do you start to break those shields down and build that human connection with somebody? So you have some common ground to build off of in the negotiation. Well, it's something we call a cold read. Okay. And you, you begin, the first thing that people want to know is, um, are you, are either, do you understand or are you going to try to understand? Everybody says, everybody thinks, all right, so I'm going to, I'm going to show that I understand because I'm going to say, I understand. Uh, and that, and that's typically um, shorthand for, look, you listen to me now. That's what people always say before they want you to listen to me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's you know, people so are tired of that. Oh, that's so, funny. You know, if, if instead, if you, if you start off um, like uh, in real estate, you could say, you know what, you know what they're facing. Tell them what they're facing. Say, mm -hmm. right, this is a confusing issue. I bet you've had plenty of real estate people in here that you just can't trust, rub you the wrong way, and they almost seem like snake oil salesmen. Mm -hmm. Now, that's actually a very calculated statement because you didn't agree with any of them. You just recognized their perspective. Mm -hmm. And you articulated the voice that's going in the back of their head anyway, which now suddenly makes you become part of the voice in their head. And suddenly they say, oh, this guy understands. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you begin to tell them what they're looking at, one of two things happen. They go, wow, this guy knows exactly what I'm faced with. There's a really good chance this guy or gal, if they know what I'm faced with, they can come up with an answer. The only other thing they might say is they're looking and you say, no, that's not it. This is what it is. Right. Which now you're in a conversation. And now they're they they didn't they didn't realize it, but now they're talking with you instead of either of you talking at them. So it's immediately it's 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 what we call a cold read. It's a hack for communications. I mean, it moves things forward so fast to articulate what your read of the situation is. You either got it right or they correct you. Either way, you're talking. Gotcha. Huh. It's That's always really we good. we've been doing it long. I'm thinking of a lady right now. I went out and uh, I did a CMA for her, and I wish I had used that. Her body language was screaming at me, uncomfortable. I should have just snapped. I, if I, Chris, why weren't you on the show two months ago, man? I could have. <laughs> come on, man. you could have saved Greg from a wildly uncomfortable business. conversation. <laughs> no, but I mean, she was uncomfortable, and I I just made the move like, hey, you know, sorry for time. I'm going to leave now. She she warmed up. We began uh, mm -hmm. began talking. But if I said, you know, you probably had a lot of people trump through here, and you probably didn't like them. They're probably snake oil uh, snake oil salesmen. They, they they're shifty. They were probably trying to tell you anything that you wanted to hear. I totally get it, and I don't like them either. Or something like that, you know, get them going on that side. That's a genius but, move. Yeah, and you just, you just stop. You don't you don't even you don't even have to agree. You just no, have to, you know to say I totally get it. I don't like them either. You didn't you didn't you don't need that part because you, that's what you want them to think, and they're more likely to think it if you don't articulate it for them. Gotcha. You just stop. Hey, I think you've had a lot of people come through. The, you know, the charlatans. Blah blah blah. Stop. Dead in the tracks. They go. 
wow, you get me. You're like, yes, I do. And exactly now right. the report begins. I give you a quick example. I'm working, I'm working uh, it's an analogy. It's not real estate, but I'm working a kidnapping in Haiti. I get, I get a call, 12 year old boys grabbed in Haiti. He's an American citizen. His father's not, but his father goes to the U S government says, and they say the FBI is going to help you. Now, I don't know what he imagined next, but I'm sure what he thought next was he was going to open a door and Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones are going to be standing there wearing sunglasses and black suits. <laughs> Instead, he gets a phone call from some guy in Washington, D.C. named Chris Voss. Now, he's in Haiti and I'm in D.C. And he literally says to me on the phone, you're in Washington, D.C., how are you going to help me? Now, I figure I get about three seconds before he hangs up the phone. Mm -hmm. I say to him, all right, look, this is, this is what's going on in Haiti. You guys got kidnappings going on all over the place. They're usually carjackings. Now, while Haitian criminals, criminals kill each other at the drop of the hat, for whatever stupid reason, they're not killing kidnap victims. And I know that makes no sense, but that's what's going on. Now, today's Thursday. The other thing that's true is Haitian kidnappers love to party on Saturday night. So if you do what I ask you to do, we'll have your son out by late Friday afternoon, early Saturday morning. He hesitates for a second, and then he says, tell me what you want me to do. Hmm. We got his son out Saturday morning. Now, I, the other part of that is he never asked me how many kidnappings I worked. He never asked me how long I've been a hostage negotiator. He didn't ask me how many times I've been to Haiti. He didn't ask me how many kidnappings I worked in Haiti. Not one resume question. As soon as I showed him, I knew what he was faced with. And by the way, you know how many times I've been to Haiti? Never. <laughs> I've, re I've resolved probably about 75 kidnappings in Haiti without ever having stepped foot in the country once, which that guy would never believe either if I told him that. Yeah. I just told him I knew what was going on by doing a cold read of the situation. Yeah, that part in your book is absolutely fascinating about how you and your team, you know, dissected the problem and then you figured out what the problem was and then how you worked them down on their prices. I, that's the part I re I went back and listened to that a couple of times. So I was just, I'm like, damn, that is, that is brilliant work right there. And you can really, you guys, I'm not going to tell you what it is, by the way, you got to go buy the dang book. That's right. Because it's, it's <laughs> worth getting your own freaking copy for, because I mean, once you, once that light bulb clicks on you, all of a sudden you can do a read on the seller or a read on the buyers coming through and you can either bring the price down or push the price up to say depending on what side you're on because you know what the you know what the um that their, their wants needs and desires are you know because you dealt with haitians you know kidnapping people we're dealing the same thing with buyers or sellers kidnapping the other person going and holding them hostage you know by their big toes trying to get them to you know pay less or pay more for a property depending on what side you're on Mm -hmm. Right, right. Or people are almost literally barricaded, you know, figuratively barricaded in a house, right? Because they, they won't take an <laughs> offer. <laughs> it's so true. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, Chris. Well, let's uh, – Greg talks a lot about uh, going for no, and there was something really interesting that you talked about when you and I spoke uh, to get you set up on the show, which is about the, the feeling that they get – uh, when they're in the position of power and you're kind of trying to negotiate with them and you give them the right to say no. So I want you to go deep on that because we talk a lot about go for no on the show. Greg is a huge fan of that concept and it's kind of changed the way he prospects. Uh, but I want to get your perspective on it and how no fits into your like the overall negotiating strategy. Yeah, well, it was a great idea that, that you know, the, the seed of it originally for, was from a book written by a good friend. Guy, guy wrote a book called Start With No. And the whole idea was, you know, let the other side feel like it's okay to say no. And his approach was like, you could turn me down at any time. You don't have to take this. You can tell me to go away at any time. You know, preserve their autonomy, if you will. They're mm -hmm. more likely to say yes if they feel like they have the option. Mm -hmm. So we started experimenting around with it a little bit. Like, ah, there's, there's, some, there's some psychological voodoo going on here around the words yes and no. Yes, people feel cornered on yes. People feel trapped. It makes them feel anxious. Hmm. What happens when they actually say no? And I got to thinking back and like when, when my son, who was my director of operations now, when he was 17, any phrase that started out with dad, can I? I said no before he even finished. <laughs> but I also realized that as soon as I said no, then I'd go, since I felt protected and, I, and, and now I'm willing to listen. I'd say, now, wait a minute, what was it that you wanted again? And he actually would have his best shot at talking me into something after I said no. So I said, you know what, let's let's just let let's run with this. Let's do some crazy stuff. Let's see what happens. 
actually my favorite story was is has been i try to uh, i try to get i try to get jack welch to uh, come to speak to my class at usc and uh i'm at a public event thousand people there everybody's asking him to try to get him to say yes to stuff right every probably got asked 150 times an hour to say yes to something i woke up to jack welch and i say is it a ridiculous idea for you to come to speak to my class that I teach at USC. <laughs> and he stops and then he looks up and to the left and he gets this just intense look on his face. <laughs> and I think to myself, I just killed Jack Welch. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's so mad. He had a stroke and he's going to fall over dead right in front of me. I mean, I got, I got really scared. Oh and then I figured I was going to get arrested. They were going to beat me up and drag me away and not care that I used to be an FBI agent. <laughs> His face finally unfreezes and he looks back at me and he says, this is my personal assistant's name. This is a special Twitter account we have set up to get a hold of her. I'll let her know you're going to reach out for her, what this is about. I think we're going to be in Los Angeles in a time frame. If we are, I'll come in and speak to your class. Whew. All because I triggered a no insane that is insane I, i'm still trying to wrap my head around that i know i am too <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that, yeah it was, it's it's the phrasing of the question that's really interesting because it's it's similar to what you do greg when you're you're just saying you know hey i bet you're not thinking about making a move right now it's it's giving them the right right up front to just start off with a no and then it takes them out of the situation where you, they feel like they're being pushed into a situation where they where they're being pressured to do something they won't they don't want to do because they feel like they've essentially not given you what you want right off the bat. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Chris, that's an interesting example because it's more of the phrasing of the question was like, uh, you know, is is it an outrageous idea for you to come in and speak? And yeah, it's just it's very it's very interesting that that got that kind of uh, that kind of response out of them. But he yeah, couldn't. Well, but, if he if he says no, I mean, it, it works for me every time. And I mean, yeah. you'd be stunned at what people are absolutely stunned at what people are willing to say no to. I have I have employees who've been given difficult tasks by their bosses, and they come back to me and they say, "How do I negotiate this with my boss? Is a problem." I say, "Go back in and say, do you want me to fail?" <laughs> 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 no. And no one has ever gotten yelled at by their boss when they've asked that question. We're a thousand for a thousand on that. You'd be stunned mm -hmm. at what people are willing to say no to because no is protection. Every so, time. so you could use this in real estate. I'm just theorizing here, something along the lines that like, you and I are the agents negotiating and I'm coming to you as a listing agent, I'm representing the buyers and you know, we're at an impasse at a very small amount or a term or something. I mean, would it be feasible to say something, well, Chris, I mean, do you want me to fail, you know, you know, on this negotiation? Would, would that be a, a plausible location in, in, in the negotiation to use this or do, would you use it? How would you use that? Well, agent to agent, you know, I, I'd, I'd look at the guy and say, yeah, do you want, do you, do you want this deal to fail? Mm-hmm, um, right. If uh, if you've got a if you got a seller whose price is too high, you want to say you, you want to say to him, do you, you want your house to sell, right? Yeah. Well, you're trying to get somebody to say yes. Instead, the question is, do you want your house to linger on the market longer than it should? No. Mm -hmm. No. Do you want do you want me to waste your time? Do you want to miss out on people that could buy would would buy your house? You know, it's 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 all, all of the yes questions that you would normally ask, with just a little bit of practice, most of them can be flipped to a no question. You get the same answer, but it moves things forward. And yeah, that's really it's it, that is, it's that is insane. Some counterintuitive stuff. Because yeah, that is the classic kind of NLP thing, you know, which is to to get that it's it's the the, the yes ladder, right? Just to, to get them to say yes, 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 yes to three things that are you've already agreed on, and then you the, the fourth thing is the ask. It's the thing they don't right. yet agree on, and you're trying to get them to just yes, 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 yes. Um, so you're saying you can actually go the exact opposite way, rephrase the questions, and get them to to tell you no, but essentially you're but it's 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 you're designing the questions in such a way that you're forming like a common ground with them. You are. You're forming a common ground. You're doing a number of things. You're, you're triggering mm -hmm. some other emotions. You're helping them avoid losses. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, the avoidance of loss is actually, it's such a powerful um, influencer on people that Danny Kahneman, who wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, he and his partner, Amos Tversky, won a Nobel Prize for behavioral economics on it. Hmm. And it basically, you know, we're, we're, the, the avoidance of loss is double the motivation than the achievement of a game. Mm -hmm. So it's a hack. You mm -hmm. just rephrase things so that you're avoiding losses instead of accomplishing gains. Your words have, have double the impact when you do that. Now, how, how do you incorporate that in, in your background with the hostage negotiations? Is that without it coming across as a threat? How do you, how do you get that little fear of loss in there? Well, it's not that we uh, we get it in there. We we look for the fear of loss that, that's driving him. And that mm -hmm. was one of the things that when I knew early on that a hostage negotiation, when I found this and I knew it was exactly the same, just different circumstances, was because a hostage negotiator is trained to look for the recent loss in a hostage taker's life, hmm. knowing that loss is a bigger motivator. And it's something that probably happened in the last 24 to 48 hours. And a loss is the motivator. It triggers people into action. So we just say, yeah, just start talking to the guy to figure out what he perceived his loss or his impending loss to be. Now, once we focus in on that, we just, we influence emotions around it, slowly get him to see things a, a different way. And before you know it, we're going to have this guy out and we're not going to give him anything. Hmm. It's incredible. I mean, just, I mean, so the go for no thing is actually a real it really does work on all different levels. It works in hostage. It works in real estate negotiations. And I, I, the thing that, I, that I'm wrapping my brain around, again, I told you guys to get out your freaking pad and paper. <laughs> I'm writing. Um, <laughs> is that the loss of gain is two times more power. The, 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 power the, the, the avoidance of loss is two times more powerful than gains. We always try to go towards pleasure and away from pain. But if you identify the pain and basically poke at it, I'm assuming, Chris, right? You know, you, you expose it, you uncover it from you know, its hiding spot and you bring it out into the spotlight. Now you, you, have, lever you have leverage to work with at that point? Yeah, no you point. not only have leverage, but it's, it's, it, it, was, it was a perception that they had to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it, it's actually self-reinforcing. You know, it's one of the few things that since it's already in their brain, it's already banging around in their brain, you just under covering something there that's self-reinforcing and it's much more of a motivator than if you try to persuade somebody because when you're trying to persuade something you're trying to put something into their head that may or may not take what you're right. trying to do is you're yeah, trying to figure out inside them what really drives them mm -hmm. yeah you're trying to find out you're trying to find what's what's there already and agreeing with that and chris you mentioned something that has been i don't know and you may have gotten this from that or you, or you may not be aware depending on how much you pay attention to the marketing world but one of the one of the famous ad adages of all time is that you enter the conversation that's already taking place in the mind of your prospect oh there you go exactly right, right? And, and 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 what we're doing here is and the reason why in the book you know we instead of calling it empathy, empathy we call it tactical mm -hmm. empathy because we know so mm -hmm. much more about it that Calling it empathy is just boring. We've gotten too much smarter about it. Mm -hmm. So we're not just looking for the conversation they're having in their head, but we're looking for specific aspects of it. And mm -hmm. we're looking for what they're afraid of losing. We're looking for what their negative thoughts are. We're looking for what their positive thoughts are. And I know that if I can get into the area, if I can have an influence on what they're afraid of losing, that, you know, it's a hack. It gives me, actually Kahneman and Tversky, and they officially said losses think twice as much Unofficially, Danny Kahneman said, that's not true. It's five times as much. We just made the number smaller because we wanted fewer people to argue with us. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually really funny. Oh, this, actually, this actually leads into a question. We actually, Natalie Wagner, she has uh, been a friend of mine for years and years. I actually trained her in door knocking many moons ago uh, down in Santa Barbara. But she's doing commercial real estate now. And Chris, I'd love to kind of, since... That kind of what we were just talking about, you know, if there's no leverage on the heartstrings, she's working with, um, um, what if you're representing an investor where, where you don't have the advantage of, of pulling on a seller's heartstrings, how could you employ a negotiating tactics to get the investor to budge off of whatever their, their issue is? If you don't have heartstrings, is there, is there, could you cold read them? What would you do? Well, I, I'd, I'd go for a cold read. I, I'd actually, to find out where I'm at and to get them to tell me the stuff that I need to know, I'm going to try to get them to say that's right. I'm going to try to summarize the, the situation from my perspective, which is the cold read and 
how they feel about it. Now they're going to respond one or two ways. Um, they're going to either tell me that's right or they're going to tell me what I'm missing. What I'm really avoiding entirely is I don't want anybody to say you're right to me because you're right is what people say to us when they're tired of listening to us and they want us to be quiet. <laughs> Sounds like past relationships, Matt. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we won't go down that path. <laughs> but it's a little, yeah, it's a little indicator that you haven't quite hit the mark, right? Or, or there's something, there's some sort of resistance there. There's, there's not an alignment in what you're saying with what they're feeling. Well, uh, it, they'll correct you if they if they want to give you an indicator. I mean, it's it's kind mm -hmm. of the the old, you know, Stephen Covey said in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People: Seek first to understand, then be understood. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so. How is okay, so Stephen, how am I supposed to do that? You know, what exactly, what the hell were you talking about when you said that? <laughs> right. Well, how we operationalize that is, is we start summarizing what the other person is saying until they either say that's right or they correct us so that we can then get them to say that's right. Mm. And, I remember. And yeah. if you, if, I'm sorry for interrupting, but people love to correct others. And we're capitalizing on that too, because as soon as we start to summarize, if we got it wrong, they're going to love correcting us. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want a two bed, not, not a four bed. I don't, I don't need all that space. Oh, okay. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I remember in your book, you were, there was a part, you were called in to do negotiation and you thought you were just killing it on this negotiation. And you go to your, I think it was your supervisor or something, and um, he just, look, you're like, so how'd I do? And he's like, that's probably the most epically horrible negotiation ever. And you were just, <laughs> and you're just like, what? I just, I just nailed that. The guy, the guy, I got him. He's like, no, you didn't. Yeah. He yeah, said, yeah, you're yeah. right, not that's right. And yeah. that subtle change. So you guys, when you're out there and you're listening to a buyer, or a seller, or a spouse, a child, and they say, you know what? You're right. You're foobard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you are really you are in a lot of trouble at that point in time. <laughs> so funny. if you get your right, how do you back out of that? Do you go back into questions to get you know that's right? And how how do you reverse the you know the, the boat at that point? Um, yeah, a real quick way is if you realize what they're really saying, then you just got to look at them and say, you know, sounds like something sounds like there's something here I just don't get. Mm. You know, I'm sensing that you feel I'm just trying to wear you down and I'm not listening to you. Hmm. You know, that that's going to be the quickest way to bang through that. And so you're almost backing out and you're doing a cold read on just that little micro part of the situation, right? Exactly. That's right. Okay. <laughs> that's fascinating because you, you allow yourself to be vulnerable for a second because you can say, you know what, I, there, there, I, there must be something I'm not, I don't, I don't understand or there's something I don't get because that puts them in a psychological power, power position over you, right? And so then they can, you know, speak to you and go, you're right, you're not getting blah, 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 which then goes back to them explaining and correcting you, which then puts you back in the driver's seat. Yeah, and 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 then also the funny position, this crazy secondary effect of putting somebody else in a power position, is the reality is you were the source of that power. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they feel empowered, but you're the source of the empowerment, and which is going to keep them from attacking you. There's actually going to be a certain amount of gratitude uh, from them towards you, because they're not going to consciously know but they're going to subconsciously realize that if they shut you off then they shut off the source of their power and, and they're not going to do that huh it's interesting this is why i told you guys to go read the dang book <laughs> i know exactly wheels are spinning okay um now let's fast forward kind of more towards what you think might be the end of the negotiation where you, where you feel like you've kind of built this up and you've uncovered what you feel like they're they're real fear of losses or what they're trying to avoid. You've, you've spent some time building some rapport with them and you're, you're kind of moving things along and you feel like you're just about to get them to the decision where they're going to give in um, and they're going to agree with you essentially and you're going to get what, what you want out of that negotiation. All of a sudden, last minute objection. Something that's seemingly out of left field, something you haven't dealt with yet. 
how do you deal with that situation? Because I'm imagining that has to come up all the time where so they just throw up something at the last minute that is completely out of left field. How do you take a step back and kind of restart and, and then bring things to a successful conclusion once that's happened? Well, at, at that point or at any point when somebody really catches you off guard with something, mm -hmm. you know, there's this great, ridiculously simplistic Jedi mind trick that always buys time and it helps you diagnose what's going on. Okay. It's what it's what we call a mirror, and it's just repeating the last three words of what they just said. That's hmm. right. I totally forgot about that in the book. That was epic. Yeah. And, uh, you, give, Chris, give us a, a practical example, because I can see um, this being horribly misused by inexperienced people. Well, all right. So give give me give me the objection that you imagine I'm saying, and then I'll just mirror it. Uh, well, let, let's say all right. So let's uh, we'll just bring him back to real estate. So you're you're. You're the agent. You're attempting to list someone's home. They're, they're supposed to sell their home with you and use you as their agent. You get all the way to the end. Everything looks good. And then all of a sudden, well, you know, my wife's brother is an agent. You know, we really probably should go with him. And it just it's completely out. Like it has nothing to do with anything you've talked about. And all of a sudden there's this personal relationship that there's all this emotional tie and political stuff involved in who they work with. And then I would just say probably should go with him. And they're going to expand. And they're going to go on. Now, what happens in that expansion um, mm -hmm. is they'll tell you whether or not that's an emotional objection, which they realize there's nothing to it, or whether they actually mean it. Uh, you know, I've got a colleague that always mirrors the other side's objections every single time because their answer will tell them, is it, is it, uh, is it a bluff or is it real? Mm -hmm. At which point in time, then you're going to get enough information, they're, they're going to go on. And you're going to know how to proceed. And then you might say, you might follow up with, you know, it sounds like the relationship with your brother-in-law is more important to you than the sale of the house. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was, that, that was very, that was, that was a good question. <laughs> I like that. Like your relationships are more important than selling of your home. So you're basically just slapping and going, look, you're screwing yourself because the house isn't going to sell. But I get it. Thanksgiving is really important to you. Good job with hey, that. But hey, for some people that might be like it, it kind of comes, it can be a little bit of, but of an underhanded slap. But for some people, it might genuinely be true. Well, it, 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 might, it might genuinely be true. And, and the issue there is always, you know, is if you approach people with deference, it's amazing what you can get away with saying. Hmm. You know, you, you could make that statement and make it with a tone of voice that it sounds like you idiot, right? <laughs> or you could say it as if you genuinely understand and appreciate the truth of it. You know, no. it sounds like the relationship with your brother-in-law is more important, which is completely different. It sounds like the relationship with your brother-in-law is more important. <laughs> right, <laughs> totally you know, is. And so yeah, you, you say it deferentially, so they love it. Humility, you know, and not not having such a big ego. Yeah. Which is hard. You know, Chris, my father, you know, he, he, he speaks very much like you. You know, he's very confident in what he's talking about. He keeps a very calm demeanor. And I've seen him use that technique and use the pull away method and, you know, you know simultaneously smacking someone, but not being mean <laughs> about it. And they yeah. come around 180. They're like, no, 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 no. We, we're just saying that he's, you know, that he's, a, that he's an agent. We're not saying we want to use him. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, yeah, there you go. Now, now we've uh, we've seen the underbelly. You're just testing me. I get it. Okay, now move forward. And I, I like the mirroring thing. I want to dive into something super quick. I do a ton of cold calls. I'm the guy that's going to call you on your house line. You're going to be like, get off the phone, kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, on these calls, I've been able to work and and massage the uh, the situation situation more. But I always get the the, the answer of I I bet you guys aren't thinking about selling your home. No, we're not. So how can I mirror that? Can I mirror that as well? Or is that just a, a statement of fact, like that is an, un, that's an unmovable or are there unmovables, but, or is there everything movable? I mean, that's like a lot of questions. Wow. Well, well, you, you know, you're opening dialogue. I mean, I, I like thinking three moves ahead, no more than three moves ahead. You know, some mm -hmm. people want to think 29 moves, seven different directions. Mm -hmm. Three, three is enough. So you could, you could, you could follow that up with, well, when you do want to sell your house, what would it look like? You know, this is, this is a win-what combination. It's what we call a time travel. I want to ask the, the what question, but I need to transform them to the moment in time, either in the future or the past when it's relevant. 
Like if you want to confront somebody about something they said to you in the past and they didn't, they didn't live up to it, you say, well, when you said that to me, what did you mean? What did you have in mind? So when you do sell the house, what's it going to look like? A hostage negotiation technique, you know, uh, we used to always go back and forth on what our opening line is going to be to the hostage taker. One of the ones that I loved was, hi, I'm Chris. I'm here to talk to you about coming out. Well, I'm not coming out. And I say, no, I didn't say you were coming out now, but when you do, what would it look like? Let's talk hmm. about when it happens, how we can make sure you stay safe so that nothing happens to you and I can get you out of there alive. So I begin, I begin then, I, I say, no, I'm not saying you're doing it now, but when you do, what's the best way so that you maximize your profits? You know, what's the best, what's going to be the best way to sell your house when you do decide to sell so that you, you move it as quickly as you can and you can move on to where your dreams are taking you? Thank you. Hmm. That's just a time travel question. That's, it, it, I love that because that gets around, like, we're never going to be selling. Okay, I understand that. But, you know, when you do, what would that look like? It's not right. like, well, do you know what I was just thinking about selling or buying? They, they're expecting that next question. They're, they're not expecting, well, what would that look like? Because it's not intrusive. You're not saying sell to me now. You're saying what would it look like? It's curiosity. And people, like you said, they love to talk to you and they love to, you know, correct you and fill you in on everything. And if you can build the rapport and do it with, like, what you talked about earlier, Chris, you know, your tonality. Because if you said, hey, you know, what would that look like? Or, hey, what's that going to look like, dick? And why'd you send them to me? <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm going to get a better response with your tonality. Oh, that's funny. Okay. All right. So uh, so I have one last question for you, Chris. We, we talked a little bit on, on in, in the prep call for this, uh, for the podcast about, you know, how, how do you realistically like build these skills? Because negotiation situations don't come up every day. It's hard to kind of get the reps in to where you really build the practical skills. And, the, and you've alluded some things to some things on your blog about kind of practicing in real life. But something that you said to me was really interesting where you talked about the difference between skill building or skills training versus situational or, or scenario based training. So can you go a little bit deeper on that just to give people an idea of how they can kind of practice these skills in their normal life? Well, in just in your just in your everyday conversations, I mean, you could you could make you can make today make today's mirror today mirror day. All I'm going to do today is I'm going to mirror people and whoever I talk to, I'm going to, I'm going to let go of trying to get stuff done just for today. Maybe do it on a Saturday when it's not even a business day so that you have less at stake, but just mirror everybody that you talk to, whatever anybody says, you just repeat, just say, repeat the last three words. It's kind of a, you know, a, a genuinely inquisitive uh, tone of voice or an understanding tone of voice. You're going to have the most fun that day. <laughs> And everybody's going to love talking to you. And I actually, I, I did this recently. Um, I had, in my MBA class at the USC, I had, one woman is working on uh, her her salary negotiation, and I wanted her mirror, so I said, spend the day mirroring. So at the end of that day, I actually talked to another student in a class, and I said, you know what? Tomorrow I wanted it to be mirror day. And then she got this funny look on her face, and she said, did did you tell Raphael to do that? today? <laughs> and I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I did. She said, I had the best conversation with her today. We had the, she, every, I had the best time talking to her today. I didn't know that's what she was doing to me. She was just, <laughs> oh, that's funny. She's just getting her repetitions in. Oh my God. Yeah. Well, this, this would actually be a good, uh, you know, in, in a personal relationship or business partner relationship, a good way to defuse a potential explosion. So if you're talking with your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your spouse, your significant other, whatever else, and they're really pushing your buttons and don't be a dick and do it with a bad tone, but do it with a nice, calm tone and be like, Oh, okay. You're, so you're going to the store later or, Oh, the baby diaper does need to be changed. You know, it, you know, she's bitching at you like, give me the diaper, the diaper, the diaper needs to be changed. And you're like, oh, the diaper does need to be changed. <laughs> oh. <okay. laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe a little bit more sense of urgency in your voice on the whole diaper changing thing. That might help. I just, I think I threw up in my mouth <laughs> with this conversation. <laughs> All right, Chris. So uh, so remind people of, uh, of the name of the book and where they should go to get it and how to connect with you. All right. Uh, name of the book, Never Split the Difference. You want to buy the book straight out? Amazon's always got the best price. I got to hand it to those guys. Um, buy it from Amazon. You can buy it at any bookstore, but you're probably going to get the best price at Amazon. How to get a hold of us, how to get better in addition to uh, reading the book, how to get free stuff out of us. We've got a, uh, a once a month 
complimentary, or not once a month, sorry, a once a week complimentary negotiation newsletter. We put it out every week. It's short and sweet, easy tips to integrate into your life that day. It's called The Edge. The best way to subscribe to that, the best way to subscribe is to send, is to send a text. That's right, all one word. No space, no apostrophe, just T-H-A-T-S-R-I-G-H-T. No apostrophe, no space. Send it to 22828. And again, the number is 22828. And it'll give you a response where you can sign up for the newsletter. You can find out where we're doing training. It'll take you to the website when you want to go there, www.blackswanltd.com. But the newsletter is really the best central location to find out about everything we're doing. Okay. Uh, and I can actually attest to that because, Chris, look what I have right next to me. I got my negotiation <laughs> skills. I got the, your recommended reading list here on some other great negotiating books. Yeah, um, yeah, the blog is really good. The Edge is good. It is uh, really, really good. But uh, so, Greg, you put the uh, the link to the book on Amazon uh, in the comments here for Facebook, guys. If you're listening or watching uh, this later on, it will be in the description and the show notes and all that good stuff, so you can get the direct link to the book on Amazon. But make sure to get the uh, the newsletter from Chris and the guys over there. And guys, if you would, if you'd like to have uh, Chris, or, or if you're tied into an organization, a broker. Or uh, if you know of a company that would like to have someone like Chris come in and speak on this topic, uh, make sure to pass that along and, and connect Chris's team up with that person. Uh, Chris, I know you're, you're doing a lot of speaking around the country, workshops and presenting and things like that uh, uh, yep. on negotiation to companies of, of all sizes. And uh, so I want people to take advantage of that if they can. So if, there, if you have any connection to people uh, that are booking uh, presentations, speaking engagements, uh, or if you, you know, you're tied into the corporate world or if you're a broker would be interested in bringing Chris in for like a workshop type training, mm. like any of those reasons, uh, guys can uh, connect up with them. Um, so, so Chris, oh, hold on, Chris, yeah. uh, it's 22828, correct? Correct. Yeah. 22828. Okay. Got that. Now I got that right in there. Perfect. Awesome. So, uh, Greg, how pe can people uh, follow and connect with you? Stalk the living shit out of me. <laughs> in the best way. And if you get too creepy, I'm sending Chris in. So you better behave yourself. <laughs> um, guys, go follow me on Facebook. All jokes aside, I have reached my 5,000. Facebook, uh, are, they're antisocial. They won't let me have more than 5,000 friends, which I don't understand, Matt. Um, but uh, follow, follow me, guys, on Facebook. If you want epic content like you got here today, I mean, you we barely scratched the surface. Go buy the book. Look. Chris and Matt and I, we don't, we're not taking a, a split from Chris. We don't get, we're not incentivized to do this. We only promote it because it's fantastic content. You will make more money in real estate by reading, highlighting, tabbing, underlining, re-highlighting, and bending the back of the book by studying it and making it your negotiating Bible. So if you don't do that, I cannot help you. We have done. We are done, my son. Okay. That's right. All we can do is lead the horses to water. We cannot force them to drink, sadly. Um, all right, so people should follow you on Facebook, Greg. They should follow me as well. Um, you can find me at Pursuing Results. Uh, that is the easiest way to get a hold of me. Guys, subscribe to the show, iTunes, YouTube, or Stitcher, depending on whether you want the video or the audio versions nestled right here between your ears where we so, so belong. So deep. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. <laughs> all right, guys. Chris, thank you so much. This has been awesome. It's exactly what we had in mind. I, I know that the content is is extremely helpful. I mean, just, just some of the comments, um, guys, we really appreciate you watching live. I mean, epic. My mind is blown. Uh, like just, you know, being people asking where to get the book and all kinds of stuff. So guys, we appreciate you watching live here on Facebook. Make sure to continue doing that. Tell people about the show. Um, we, we get to have amazing guests like Chris because of you guys listening, watching and telling your friends and the mm -hmm. listenership the show keeps on growing uh, so we can get bigger and bigger guests that deliver amazing content like this so guys the more people that you tell uh, the more that you help uh, spread the show grow the show and bring uh, guests like Chris onto the show so it's a nice uh, virtuous cycle which we like it is it, 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 it is when like always guys we always say that we do this because we love because we truly do Matt and I put a lot of money a lot of time and a lot of energy into this uh, and it's all because we want you guys to live the life that you truly want to have without ha being browbeat and being kicked in the rear end by the some other folks who charge you for this information having Chris on should change your negotiating skills our other guests will change other aspects of you so we love you we do it for you and Matt uh, did, did we did we just put a bow on it I think we put a bow on it Ooh, put a, okay <laughs> all right ninjas we gone players we'll see you on Friday bye